In the Roaring Twenties, Americans were looking for glamour. They wanted it in their fashions, in their music, and in their automobiles. Style prevailed, and everyone wanted a car. There was a study done in the 1920s that uh, people would rather have a car than a bathtub. Not that they didn't want a bathtub, but they could get along without a bathtub, but they had to have a car. In this capricious atmosphere, Walter Chrysler was able to transform his upstart car company into the last of Detroit's big three automakers in just four short years. But in 1929, the stock market crash plunged the nation into the Great Depression. For many Americans, new cars were no longer affordable. It was a unique problem for the big three, which had become accustomed to ever-increasing sales each year. They all struggled. Uh, they, their sales dropped um, you know, by uh, amounts that we would find inconceivable. Uh, you know, they, they, between 1929 and, and 1933, which was the bottom, uh, most of the car companies saw their sales drop by 75 percent. Uh, and so they, uh, they, they were operating um, right on the edge of, of going out of business. In 1928, Chrysler had introduced the Economical Plymouth, the first car in its price class to offer features like four-wheel hydraulic brakes and floating power engine mounts. Customers could choose from among seven different Plymouth models, each with an average price of less than $700. Chrysler's timely entry into the low-priced automotive field would prove to be its salvation during the difficult Depression years. Walter Chrysler wanted to prove, I think, that he could do it. The story is when they, when they did the first uh, floating power Plymouth, uh, they took it off the line, drove it over to uh, Dearborn, and went and had lunch with uh, Henry, and Edsel, uh, Henry and Edsel Ford. And then um, after lunch, they said, come on out here, I want to show you something. Showed him the new car and left it with the Fords and took a taxi home. Sort of like, uh, hey, this is my calling card. Now, now I can play with you guys. By the mid-30s, Chrysler had surpassed Ford as America's second largest producer of passenger cars. It was an amazing achievement, and the company's early success may have prompted it to move quickly to the next level of vehicle development, the one-of-a-kind car called the Chrysler Airflow. Here it comes on its death drop, leaping clear of the ledge and landing with crushing impact in the rocky shale beneath. You, you can see the film footage in our exhibit of driving the airflow over a cliff, uh, having it go end over end and then the doors open and it gets driven away. A lot of people have said, well, if they had introduced that same car three or four years later, it might have been a home run. We'll never know that. The Airflow was the first attempt to coordinate automotive engineering and design in a single package and the first car with unit body construction. But in 1935, most people just didn't understand it. The Airflow was simply ahead of its time. One person has described the airflow as having the same anonymity as a uh, person with a nylon stocking over his face, in which all of the features are sort of pushed together. And the public just didn't accept that. The airflow's failure in the marketplace had long-lasting effects. Chrysler executives vowed not to take chances on new product designs. Chrysler was, uh, was dominated by the engineers in the, and the, the bodies were, if not entirely an afterthought, they, the, the styling, the look of the car was less important than what was underneath. Critics often say Chrysler products became stodgy and dull in the late 1930s. But the conservative look was exactly what Walter Chrysler's hand-picked successor wanted, the man called K.T. Keller. Keller was the same kind of man. He knew plants, he knew people. There was, a, I think, a symbiotic relationship between the two, and uh, um, he, I think he always planned to have Keller as a, his successor. In 1938, Walter Chrysler suffered a severe stroke. After his death two years later, Keller was firmly in command. Next on the Chrysler Chronicles, the company enters a new era. The automotive industry witnesses the birth of a union and the beginnings of another world war. Coming soon on CEN. <laughs>